The Hunger Games series has just gotten a resurgence thanks to the new prequel film Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes coming out in November. However, I want to take a look back at the original trilogy and analyze what makes this series so special and why it resonates with so many people all around the world. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. It will greatly help the channel with the algorithm. And if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button and you can also follow me on all of my socials, all of which are linked down below and all of which house similar content that I do here on this channel. Before we start, I want to thank today's sponsor, Displate. Displate is about collecting your passions and getting inspired. It's a one-of-a-kind metal poster, it's passion printed on metal. This allows it to be incredibly sturdy, eliminating the flimsiness of a paper poster, which can be so frustrating. It's also easy and safe to hang with its unique magnet mounting system, which also makes it stay up much better and eliminates any lines that might be on a normal poster. The cool thing about the magnet system is you can easily switch different posters out for the other, meaning you can quickly change the decor without ruining your wall. This plate has so much to choose from, having too many fandoms to count with Harry Potter, Marvel, DC, Avatar The Last Airbender, Star Wars, Back to the Future, and so much more. They also work with 40,000 notable artists, have 1.3 million designs available for you, and they deliver to 56 different countries. As I said, this plate is a good alternative to standard paper impressions or canvas printings, and it's even cheaper when you use my link and use my discount code MOVIEFLAME. You get 20% off if you buy one to two display posters, and 30% off if you buy three or more posters. It's a great offer, so don't miss out. You'll get a great product, and you'll help support the channel with every single purchase you make. Now that I've said that, let's get the video started. I think one of the reasons why The Hunger Games resonates with so many people is because the author of the series, Suzanne Collins, has so many parallels to us, that being our own society, and even more what it could become. Collins exaggerates our biggest flaws both in today's world and also in the past, and beautifully translates these faults into the three books. The most obvious parallel to history is the Roman Empire, which hits on the flaws from our past. Gladiator fights were commonplace, as the citizens of the Roman Empire watched people fight to the death in an arena, just like the citizens of Pan Am watched children fight to the death in an arena. The arena in the Hunger Games series is obviously on a much larger scale, which is a common theme you'll see as I go through this video, Suzanne Collins taking our history and exaggerating it for her own story. The way she depicted the Hunger Games mixes together our past of arena fighting with our current world where we consume entertainment and reality TV. It combines our brutal and violent history with our unhealthy need to have technology and entertainment at our fingertips. If the Romans had the technology that we have today, the Hunger Games might have been the result with constant coverage of the event before, during, and after. It perfectly links our past, present, and future and shows what we have the potential to become. Another parallel Suzanne Collins took from the real world is body image. The people in the capital are obsessed with body modifications like skin dyeing, implants, tattoos, and other bizarre modifications, all things that we have today. But again, Collins exaggerates it for her own story. Collins is so good at commenting on our modern day world using only a fictional story as her tool, and I think this adds a dimension to the story that we as audience recognize in ourselves, thus making us more invested. This series also touches on the feminist movement by, oddly enough, not actually touching on it. And what I mean by that is that there are no gender roles in this story. Women have every opportunity and every ability to do what men do, and no one questions it. No one even remotely thinks or acts in a way that would suggest any bias toward men or women. Some of the strongest people in the series are women, like Joanna and Enoberia, and they hold their own against the most powerful men like Finnick and Gale. When you really look at it, there's a very small gap between the two genders, showing no favoritism to either. Then, Katniss, the main hero of the story, is a woman who has more athleticism, heroism, and hunting and fighting abilities than most. It goes to the point that had Katniss been a boy, the basic story wouldn't have been that different. Obviously, there are some small things that make her feminine, like the outfits that Cinna makes her, but that could easily be tailored to a man's wardrobe, and those scenes never get to the point where it's degrading or playing down the role of women. I think this is something that made the series intriguing to both male and female readers, especially because it differs greatly from other famous franchises that have the damsel in distress always having to be saved by the male hero. This is also something that makes readers fall in love with Katniss. She's a hero without trying to be. The thing that makes Katniss a hero is just her being herself. She's a hero because of the way she treats people, the way she acts, and the values that she holds. Let's have everybody think of one incident where Katniss Everdeen genuinely moved you. I'd like you all to think of one moment where she made you feel something real. No one told her what to do. Unscripted, yes. 
She wasn't a hero because she was the best warrior or because she accomplished the most. She's a hero because of the way she treated Rue and the way she gave her a beautiful send-off. She's a hero because she protects the people she loves, no matter what that means for her own well-being, the best example being her volunteering in her sister's place for the 74th Hunger Games. I volunteer! I volunteer! I volunteer as tribute! Katniss is a hero just by being herself. And that's not to say that she's not an incredible warrior and doesn't kick ass on the battlefield, because of course she does. But the thing that makes Katniss special and different from other heroes and other stories is the fact that her heroism comes from her heart and not her muscles. It shows how powerful just one voice can be. Another way Collins parallels some struggles in the real world is with alcoholism and drug addiction. In the story, Hamish is of course an alcoholic and Joanna is a drug addict addicted to painkillers. Throughout the books, Collins made us see why the two of them are like this, both suffering tremendous loss. Hamish lost everyone he loves when Snow killed his mother, brother, and girlfriend. Meanwhile, Joanna went through tremendous horrors after being tortured for months by the Capitol. Grief and PTSD are real life issues that many people have suffered with, and by adding this to the series, it makes the story and these characters feel more real and makes the world that Collins created more believable. And going off of that, the series also comments on eating disorders, with the capital citizens drinking concoctions to make themselves throw up just so they can eat more. People are starving in 12. Here they're just throwing it out to stuff more in. Katniss? And on the other end, this also touches on starvation, as the districts are quite the opposite from the capital, starving sometimes to death, which almost took the main hero out at one point. Hunger is something in history that sparks rebellion, which is very fitting for the series considering it's called The Hunger Games. The title The Hunger Games can have another meaning past the literal term of hunger, instead being looked at as the districts being hungry for freedom. This title makes reference to the real-life French Revolution, as that rebellion started due to their king letting his citizens starve. Both the French citizens in real life and the citizens of Pan Am had a rallying point, Starvation and the Mockingjay. In the series, the Mockingjays were created through the capital's failure when they created Jabberjays, birds that could repeat any phrase they heard. The capital used them to spy on the rebels during the first rebellion, but the rebels caught on and started feeding them misinformation. This led to the capital scrapping the project and releasing all of the Jabberjays, who then went on to mate with Mockingbirds, thus creating the Mockingjay. These birds symbolize a failure from the capital, and as Katniss described them, they were something of a slap in the face to the capital. However, Mockingjays came to mean so much more when Katniss was given the pin with this bird on it. After wearing it in the first games, people started to see that the Mockingjay was a sign for resistance, and eventually that becomes the base of the rebellion, just as hunger was the base for the French Revolution. And eventually, Katniss, the face of the rebellion, actually becomes the rallying point, the Mockingjay. This is the revolution, and you are the Mockingjay. The Capitol created the Mockingjay, just as the Capitol created Katniss as the face of the revolution when putting her in the games in the first place. Both things they didn't mean to make, backfiring on them, made through their own poor choices and failures, both of those failures forming together to create both the symbol and the person of the rebellion that would ultimately take the Capitol down. It's cool that the title of the series, Hunger, pairs with the logo of the series, The Mockingjay, linking both the districts and the French Rebellion's rallying points, and showing us how influential the French Revolution was for Collins when writing the series. It's again an example of Collins taking a past we're familiar with and using it to draw us in. And going off of that, Collins also commented on other real-life political struggles. Political struggles are the obvious basis of every corrupt government or dictatorship, no matter what time period you're in. This includes the destructive force of humans, the unjust social hierarchy, and the dangers of abusive and higher powers. Collins made this translate to her series perfectly. These themes and motifs are obvious with Snow and his need to control through fear and intimidation. To those who ignore the warnings of history, Prepare to pay the ultimate price. Snow gives the people of Pan Am a distraction through the Hunger Games. Your job is to be a distraction so people forget what the real problems are. This element of distraction was very common in the Roman Empire's government, making the citizens forget about the real problems while watching this brutal entertainment. Snow knows that the system is fragile, as each district relies on the other to survive, and the capital relies on all of the districts more than anyone in Pan Am. It must be a fragile system if it can be brought down by just a few berries. Yes, it is indeed. 
Snow's brutality with things like making people Avoxes or cutting people's tongues out is another quality we see in our own history with some of the most ruthless dictators, like Hitler branding his prisoners. These are things we see time and time again in history, dating all the way back to the Romans and even as recently as today. In the three novels, Suzanne Collins takes bits and pieces from our past and makes her own corrupt government. She does this by commenting on our own current government and the flaws that we have as a society. This is perfectly remarked in a passage from the third book Mockingjay. Plutarch says, We're going to form a republic where the people of each district and the capital can elect their own representatives to be their voice in a centralized government. Don't look so suspicious, it's worked before. In books, Hamish mutters. In history books, says Plutarch. And if our ancestors could do it, then we can too. Katniss then thinks, frankly, our ancestors don't seem much to brag about. I mean, look at the state they left us in with the wars and the broken planet. Clearly, they didn't care about what would happen to the people who came after them. This is so interesting because she's talking about us, mainly Americans. We are the ancestors who would elect their own representatives and that left the world in the state of violence and pollution. Collins perfectly ties us into this conflict, making us the problem. It shows that we are the reason why the world in this fictional story is the way it is. It makes the book seem so much more real and so much more plausible. She's commenting on our own state with our lack of initiative to fix our planet, the wars we're fighting, and how we selfishly don't think about the future and those that come after us. Obviously, this is very exaggerated, a theme I've mentioned in Colin's writing, but it also sends a message to readers that we need to change what we're doing while also telling a very intriguing story. Being part of the novel you're reading pulls readers in so much as we feel as though we are part of this dystopian world, even if we're not painted in the best light. But that's honestly a good thing because it also gives us a wake up call. The Hunger Games series also parallels war tactics that we've seen in the real world. This specifically links to World War I, especially with the way both sides use propaganda. Looking more closely, this once again demonstrates how Collins links the past and the present by making the propaganda messages similar to the ones in World War I, but blending our common use of technology to make this propaganda, and even more, by using future technology to hack into the other's TV signal to display these messages. Every district's saying this? Yes, but not the capital. Collins also touches on something that is a real fear today, that being nuclear warfare. In the series, District 13's sole job was to make these nuclear weapons, paralleling the real-life town Los Alamos, the town Oppenheimer created, where they did nothing but work on the nuclear bomb just like District 13. It again parallels our history while also telling about our future, because that's what the Hunger Games series is. It shows what we can expect if we continue down this path. It's also tragically poetic that the thing that supposedly destroyed District 13 was their own creation, these nuclear bombs, which has even more of a deeper meaning because it shows how we can destroy ourselves. Although this ended up not being true for District 13, as they struck a deal with the capital to move underground before the bombing, the rest of the country thought that the dropping of these nuclear weapons on 13 was real, and this subsequently ended the war between the districts and the capital during the first uprising, just as the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings pretty much ended World War II in real life. It's another perfect parallel to our history that we recognize and makes us resonate with the story. And this goes even further, as we move ahead to the future both in the story and in real life. For Pan Am, it's been 75 years since the deadly bombing, while at the time that the book was written, it had been 65 years since the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. It's really fascinating that there's only a 10 year difference between the two, which really makes the parallel of the District 13 and Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings add up even more. Then, in both futures, both sides have stockpiled nuclear bombs and continue to create more, and there's this same fear about the use of them, both in fiction and in the real world. Yeah, we could have bombed the capital, but they would have retaliated with at least twice the firepower. Then what? There would have been nobody left to claim victory. It's the fear of nuclear warfare, but once again, the book shows us what we could become when the capital bombs District 12, destroying everything and everyone there. A real fear that people have today. So, why am I going over all of these parallels to the real world? Well, by crafting a story that highlights every point of our history, our modern life, and our future, it makes a series that is intriguing and meaningful if you're part of the human race, and I think that's a big reason why the books resonate with so many people. They tell a story that we can understand, but Collins does it in a very exaggerated and entertaining manner that also draws us in to this dystopian world and these over-the-top characters. It really shows the brilliance behind this trilogy of books and makes me realize why this series has been so successful. 
Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life like my cute dog Loki and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe and look out for more great movie flame videos on the way.